Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. We're coming to you a little bit later in the week than usual because we've got a very important guest coming on shortly. He's definitely worth tuning in for whenever you're listening to this. And there'll be a bit of Champions Cup chat as well. And speaking of people worth tuning in for, Johnny, how you doing? Yeah, good, mate. <laughs> um, kids are all on holiday. The sun is shining, so it's beach bars, it's rosy, it's as many chips as you can eat, mate, um, has been our life for the past three, four days. Um, but no, all good. All good. Actually not working this weekend for the first weekend in a long time. So looking forward to a bit of downtime. It is Fête des Mères over here as well, which is Mother's Day on oh, Sunday because yeah. I, well, I completely missed British Mother's Day, didn't I? So we're celebrating the French one on Sunday. You get um, two chances. No, that's good. We'd, we'd all like that. Luckily, I think when you have dual citizenship, you can choose. If you mess up, you get to cover your tracks for the next one. So we're celebrating um, the French one on Sunday. But mate, otherwise, all good. Um, as I said, looking forward to not working this weekend, watching the rugby, enjoying it from the couch with a beer, um, as I'm sure everyone else is. And what is the general consensus in France? Because in the UK and Ireland, we're hearing a lot of Leinster heavy favourites. Yeah. La Rochelle did beat them convincingly in last year's semi-final which seems a long time ago now so what's changed and what's the general feeling in in France well, I think even in France Leinster are still labeled heavy favorites there's a feeling of it can be done because we've done it um and they did the I think they'd be in 32 23 um but there are big differences to this game um it's not at Marcel de Flandre which is an absolute fortress it's at the velodrome in Marseille so you don't have home advantage Last year, you also you weren't playing against first string. The halfbacks then were McGrath and Ross Byrne. This year, you're playing against Gibson Park and Johnny Sexton, which is a different kettle of fish. And then again, it's the personnel. So it looks like Victor Vito's out. Tora Carballo think he's going to be out. They're trying to fashion some amazing magic glove to come from Ireland, but I don't think it's arrived. A broken hand, unfortunately, he's out. Ihaya West last year when they won, was 100% in front of the sticks. This year, being a little bit more wobbly. Um, so look, I think everyone recognises the level that Leinster are at. We also all saw the semi that, that La Rochelle went through and it wasn't exactly the same quality. So th there's a bit of apprehension. Um, Leinster, I think, still, even by all the Frenchies, are still heavy favourites, but there's a, it can be done. It has been done, but it will have to be the performance of their season. And you don't have to worry about the sweat patches like you did in the semi-final or semi couch <laughs> this time round. The 31 Swimming. degrees it could be. Swimming. But 31 degrees. So who does that favour? Nobody. I think this is a myth, mate. Like no, nobody, when you're over here and the sun comes out, I mean, yes, it's great for spectators. You want to be in the sunshine watching the game with a beer, but nobody, like even the Fijian boy, like nobody loves playing in 31 degrees. It's horrendous. So again, the pace that Leinster play their game at, are they going to be able to keep it up in 31 degrees in that type of, those types of conditions? I'm not quite sure, but that doesn't suit anybody. Um, Yes, La Rochelle will be more used to it. They've trained in it. Players will have been, they've grown up with it a little bit more, but it's not enjoyable. Like, don't get me wrong. No, no French boys enjoy playing in 31 degrees. It's miserable for both sides. And the Leinster lads, the Irish boys coming over all pasty. Um, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how that level and that intensity that they play, the speed with which they play their game, if they can keep it up in 31 degrees, it will be horrible for both sides. That is the honest answer. You mentioned it. I was going to ask. Leinster's rook speed is a huge feature. How did La Rochelle slow them down without sort of exposing themselves defensively? Maybe the weather is the answer, but how else do you do it? The weather is the answer. You have to have the perfect game. Like they essentially have to boss every facet of the game. You have to hold on to ball, control possession. You've got to starve Leinster as much as possible of their own ball. Take every opportunity that you manage to create um, and exploiting any errors that Leinster make. That, that's across the park. It's every single area of the game. You have to pressurise everywhere. We saw last year when La Rochelle did beat them, outstanding launch plays, knocking Leinster onto the back foot defensively, and the quality of ball carry, grinding them down, grinding them down and taking points, essentially every opportunity that present themselves. So, But that has to be everywhere. That is achieving parity at set piece up against Furlong and Ryan, um, two of the best in the game. So not allowing Leinster long phases of play, defensively being immaculate and then the quality of the work in the collision area big double tackles accuracy at turnover um i think breakdown will be absolutely huge which lends quite now to, well to our guest coming on very shortly but essentially it has to be the perfect game let's get our guest on now then and we can have a chat with a man who's been a leading light for la rochelle in recent seasons as they've risen towards the top of european rugby 
but he's made the decision to hang up the boots now at the age of just 29. La Rochelle back row, Fionn Liebenberg joins us. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks to you, Tim. We will come on to your journey because it's a fascinating one shortly. But let's have a brief chat about the Champions Cup final first. We're recording this quite late in the week. You're in Marseille in your lovely hotel room. We can see it behind you. Very interesting background. <laughs> yeah. um, how have the preparations gone? Tell us. Um, yeah, it's been a good week of preparation. Um, always like like any final, you know, you have this feeling of the of the pressure. Um, so it's also having good preparation, but at the same time trying to to manage that uh, pressure of the of the final. Um, we've had a really nice send off. We left uh, what was it yesterday or Thursday. Uh, we had a really nice send off. Uh, all the people from town came to the airport to to wish us well. Um, so no preparation being been really going well. Um, I think we we well prepared. We as prepared as we can be. Um, obviously looking forward to a to a crack over game. Are you happy to be underdogs? And like Rog just talked yeah. this week about, look, we have a game plan. So how are you going to go about beating them? I think for our team, actually, it, it really suits us being considered the underdogs. We uh, last year we played in the in the final as well. Um, the Europe final against Toulouse and for that game I think they actually had us as the favourites and it, I don't know it didn't really sit well with us we, we're not used to like being the favourites we like La Rochelle has been a team that in a very short amount of time actually since it's I think it's only seven years that it's been in like the, the top 14 league um, that's managed to like achieve quite a bit of success um, so they always kind of have the stigma as like kind of a bit of an underdog team and then last year when they considered us as favourites, like uh, I think like it, it added unnecessary pressure. So I think this year, like being considered underdogs, it, I, I think it suits our team and our character quite well. Um, that being said, as an underdog, um, I suppose you you have to take risks, you know, if you if you want to if you want to beat the team that's said to be the favourites. So um, I think yeah, we want to play to our strengths. Like our set pieces has been has been really good throughout the competition. But as well, like we we might have to take some calculated risks if we if we want to stand a chance of beating this team. I can't wait to see these risks. I've been like I've been like <laughs> that shows something different. But I'm like again, we, we look back to last year in the semi final, where you know you blew them off the pitch. You guys were absolutely phenomenal. But yeah. some of that was off the field thinking. You saw launch plays like you were opening them up completely yeah. clean breaks. Do you draw on the fact and take confidence from the fact that you've done that, or do you see Leinster as a completely different proposition now. I, I have to say, looking at them uh, this season compared to last season, they they do look. They, it seems like they're playing the ball a bit more. Um, they're really having good inter interconnection plays between the forwards and backs. Um, they also seem like a team that they're taking a lot more risk with ball in hand. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see them exactly as the same team um, that we played last year. We obviously want to take a bit of confidence. Um, from from the fact that we have already beaten them once, um, but again, that being said, we don't take them lightly um, in any sense. I, I do think actually they they might have improved quite a bit on the game from from last year. You mentioned the send off that the fans gave you in La Rochelle. Just give anyone who's not been, who's not aware of the club, an idea of what it means to them, because obviously two finals last season you mentioned how new La Rochelle are in terms of the top flight how much does this reaching another European final mean to those fans yeah so it's it's quite intense like the the supporters in, in La Rochelle like it's a it's a fairly small town um it's not it's not like a big city so um and there's only really one big sport and that, that's rugby so so people just live for rugby. Um, so everything is pretty much covered in, at the moment, is covered in like black and yellow, which is our like team's colors. Um, and people just like go crazy. So at the airport, for example, we were like, I don't know, that row must have been like, I don't know, like 500 meters long of people, just stacks and stacks of people. I, I'm glad this year, at least they put up barriers so they, the people <laughs> couldn't, get to, <laughs> couldn't get to us. But like, there's like, I don't know, they have like these smoke bomb things that they that they light. It's like black and yellow smoke. And there's like a band playing and people beating on drums and people just shouting, going crazy. Um, no, so, so people like rugby is quite intense here and people live for, for rugby. Um, and that's, that's a good thing as a player. It, it does motivate you. Um, sometimes it also it can be a bit of like an added pressure as well, you know, like we obviously 
we want to make that sound proud and we want to make uh, we want to bring home a cup for the team like we, we feel like they the town and the people deserve it um, they've been really loyal fans um, so yeah hopefully hopefully we can do it but uh, like I said people people just live correctly in the show. And is that something that's been spoken about with Ronan O'Gara, for instance, the mental aspect of the game and using those experiences as a learning perspective? Is that something that's been brought up as a group? Do you discuss that as a look, yeah, we've been here, we've done this, we we'll take the learnings, we move on? Like I said, part, part of the preparation was exactly on that as well and how to like kind of kind of handle the, the pressure of it, you know, like because we have in the back of our minds the fact that we did play a final uh, last season. We played two of them, actually, and that we actually did come up short. Um, so th- we don't want that thing to go into like a negative spiral of like, what if it happens again? You know, what if we another final and we come short again? Um, and we were quite lucky. Um, Victor Vito, he stood up early in the in the week and he like addressed the whole group. And he just talked a lot about like, um, just admitting that the pressure is there. And like, we, we can't deny that it's there. Denying it doesn't help, help to go away. Uh, but just kind of using it as, as, a, as a motivation and kind of just like walking towards that pressure and like seeing it as excitement, you know. Um, and the, like the group really responded very, very good to that. And so I, I think we kind of, we, we're not looking back, we're kind of looking forward to the pressure um, and we want to, we want to feel it. We want to experience that pressure again. We always, we talked about as well, like it's a privilege to be able to play in those games where you have that pressure, you know, like, all of us want to play in the final. All of us want to win a cup. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just two teams that get to do it. So, like, it's an immense privilege. And so we try to use that as a motivation as well. Let's talk about your journey then, because you came over to France first in 2015, went to Montpellier, Jake White brought you over. So at the time, obviously, you had captain the Springbok under 20 side, won a world title. How big a decision was that to move over to France in the first place? Yeah, so actually, it was a bit... Um, my things turned out a bit quite weird actually because so I played uh, my junior rugby years I played at the Bulls and it went really really well um, also played a bit of varsity rugby as well there in Pretoria as well and uh, like I was quite lucky to at a young age already like um, win a few titles we won um, two varsity cup titles we won like um, uh, under 21 title we won with the with the Springboks we won the junior world, uh, world cup title as well um, and then I kind of started like making my breach with the with the seniors, and for some reason I like I, I had a really I had a really really tough time. Um, I was at a time at the Bulls also where there was a lot of like senior players who really been there for quite a while, and that they were there when the Bulls also reached had a lot of success. Um, so I just had a bit of a tough time just like making my putting down my mark, and um, so at that time actually. I was like kind of finding myself at the end of a contract. And then the call came from, from Jake um, in, in Montpellier. And at that time, it was like kind of perfect timing because I was also just finishing my studies. I was doing a um, uh, uh, bachelor's in uh, construction management. And so I just finished my studies and I was kind of looking forward to the to like a next adventure, a new journey. And so that call came from Jake and I was, I was like, found out I was in France. I was like, oh, awesome. I'm going to be able to travel Europe a bit. Um, so like it, the timing was was just perfect, and then um, yeah. So then I arrived as at first I just arrived as like a young player, and then I was quite lucky as well to um, there were some injuries and I, I managed to to have a few starts, and then after a while I actually became like one of the regular starters of that team. We've spoken to Paul Valemsi, who you played with in that twenty side. You play with at Montpellier as well. Obviously a big mate of yours. Yeah. You've seen the route that he's taken loving rugby and now playing for the French side. Was there any part of you with your evolution in French, like you've captain sides over here, you've been an ever-present and everywhere you've been. Was there any part of you that thought maybe you might want to give a shot at playing for the French national setup as well? Yeah, no, no. It was actually in, uh, when I came over, actually, um, it was something that I thought about. It, it wasn't like, uh, it was kind of, it was just a dream, to be honest. Like, it was like, oh, if that, if that does happen, it, it'll be great, uh, you know, but I'm, in a way, I kind of thought that it, it wouldn't be wouldn't be possible because I, I think when I came over, you had to be at least play for three years or something in France to be able to uh, play for the French team. And then while, while I came over in those first three years, then it actually changed to, you no, know, you actually have to have a French passport. So And to get the French passport, you have to wait five years um, to, to be able to do it. So then it, it pushed that 
dream even further out for me. Um, so it, it was it was a dream. I actually, I just recently literally became French, like recently, like uh, a month ago. Um, but yeah, unfortunately now I'm, <laughs> I've actually decided to stop rugby. So that, that's, obviously, <laughs> that's obviously not going to happen anymore, even, even but, though I have the papers. But you have the papers. Obviously, if you're traveling as well, it'd be great to have a, a French passport as opposed to the Green Mamba. This is an African oh, passport. The Green Mamba is the worst passport in the world, man. I, I love my country, <laughs> but man, they got to get us a better passport. <laughs> And to go back to the start, how much fun, again, you must have had some time when you arrived in Montpellier with Paul. Take us back to the early days of arri arriving as a youngster in Montpellier, big student city. You must have had a great time together. Yeah. So, um, I, I would, like I said as well, like I was very lucky to end up in Montpellier as well. I actually, actually before uh, Jake White called uh, to get me to come to Montpellier, I had a call from uh, Oya now. Um, and back in the day, I didn't know, I didn't know at all, like where that was, you know, I just thought, okay, great. It's in France. It must be cool. Um, Paul was at Grenoble, wasn't it? So he was <laughs> not far away. Yeah. Paul told you. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It was only, it was only when I arrived in Montpellier, we went to go play at all year now when I realized like, oof, really glad I didn't actually uh, end up going there. Um, but no, Montpellier was, was also a big student town. Um, we discovered also that like the local Irish bar in Montpellier it used to be like a hang. We all do uh, midweek midweek Guinness, um, and so no, we uh, I had a great time. It, it was great having like I had Paul there. We were really we were really good mates. We actually lived together in South Africa before before I came over. Um, but there were also a lot of other youngsters that I I played with at the Bulls as well. Um, I was there. Jacques Duplessis was there. Um, Janse, Janse van Rensburg, some guys I played with the Bulls, so it was great to have like kind of a community away from home as well. Um, but yeah, I know it was, it was awesome. I was, I was also very fortunate. I also met my wife in, uh, in Montpellier as well, um, who actually is a South African girl as well, who immigrated with her parents to, to France. So like, I am, I'm, I'm actually, I, at the moment I'm in Irish, but when I finish rugby, I'm actually going to go back and live in Montpellier because I, I just enjoy the, the town and the the weather also is, is amazing. We have a lot of sunshine all out the year, so um, I still have very have a very fun place for for that town. And you mentioned living with Paul in South Africa, then moving over, being with him in Montpellier, and now you're with Raymond Rule, Dylan Leeds, who you captained in that side back in 2012. It's crazy, isn't it? You're all together again. Yeah, it, it's so weird how how it works out. Like I, yeah, we played with Raymond and them then. I went, I went back to the Bulls. They went to their respective clubs. And you, you don't think much of it, you know, like we, during that s 20 process, it was great spending time together, but then you just leave and you go off your own ways. And like, you never even think, it doesn't cross your mind that you'll cross paths again. Um, and I mean, especially, I mean, they came to France. There are many other clubs they could have ended up at, but they, they ended up here. Um, so it's been a massive privilege as well. Because when, when we were younger, actually with Raymond and uh, Dylan, um, we actually didn't know each other like that well. Uh, we were all like quite young back then. But now it's it's been a great time, like kind of catching up and actually really getting to to know each other. Um, it's been an immense privilege. When you left Montpellier, obviously you decided to go to La Rochelle. What was the the major factors in that move? Was it the people there? Was it the club? Was it the area? Was it desire to stay in France? Um, were there options further afield? What what were your motivators in, in signing with La Rochelle? Yeah, again, um, it was it was a bit of a um, I kind of left Montpellier, um, not not really in the in the way that I wanted. Um, I when I, when I was there when I was playing Montpellier, I had like two bad wrist injuries, uh, two seasons in a row, and I was out for quite a long time. And then um, I actually, when I came back from those injuries, I had I haven't had a lot of game time. So I was actually there was a time when I was actually they loaned me out as well to a second division club, uh, Bézier. Um, so I spent around like four months. Um, at Bézier, which was was a great experience as well. Very grateful for that experience. I actually met some guys there that are now playing with me at La Rochelle, so it was awesome. Um, then I came back to Montpellier. Um, I still had another year contract left at Montpellier, um, but for some reason <laughs> they decided. I just came back from my I came back from my holidays. I was I, it was actually my honeymoon. Actually, I just I got married that summer and I got back from my honeymoon. And as I came back from my honeymoon, I got the call basically that they said they 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 weren't gonna keep me on even until the end of the year. So they were basically like cutting my contract short. Um, and so Brutal. I kind of I kind of didn't leave uh, Montpellier willingly, if you want. 
Um, so then I, I was like newly married, like I'm gonna have a family to look after one day. Like I need to. That, that's kind of also a moment for me when, when like rugby went from just being something we do for fun to now all of a sudden like, oh, well this is serious, you know, like business, big, like financial implications. Like if I don't find a contract, like what am I gonna do? Um, and now all of a sudden, now being married, I'm also like not responsible just for me, but like for my wife as well. Um, it's horrible, isn't it? So, yeah, so oh. you know, <laughs> she can't work if she has to, you know. But uh, but uh, no, I, I was, it was it was a, it was a weird period. It was like it was it was a moment for me when when like rugby turned from something being just a game that we play for fun to like something that's like serious. And um, and it was long story short. Then I it was very shortly after after my then I stopped with Montpellier that I got a call from La Rochelle. Um, and it wasn't actually a club that I initially, because when I spoke to my agent, he was like, I, I, I didn't want to like end up, for me, it was important to end up like in a nice town as well, you know, to not just play rugby in a club, but, you know, Vegas can't always be choosers. You have to take what you get. So um, I was quite lucky to get a call from Rochelle, which wasn't initially like one of the clubs that I like was interested. I didn't know much about it. Like it was on the other side of the, the coast. I didn't know much about, didn't know about the town, didn't know too much about the team, you know. Um, and then they had a um, spot open as a medical joker because they had two big injuries on loose forward. Um, and so I got the call, I decided to to go. Um, and then I did what I was like, I did like six months medical joker in La Rochelle and then it went really well. I played all the time. Um, and then after those six months, they decided to extend my contract for three more years. Well, it couldn't have worked out better, but the realities of professional sport, Johnny. Happy honeymoon. Congratulations. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there, but it is brutal. It is, and people don't realize as well, the outside world, you think rugby, you know, it's not quite like football and it's not quite as cutthroat, but it absolutely is. Um, and especially getting the call coming back from honeymoon, that must have been yeah. horrific to explain to it your missus killer. as well. It was the killer. I was, I was, so, I was uh, we went away to Greece for our honeymoon. Um, and then we came back to France, but it was still kind of like, it was like kind of the second half of the honeymoon, you know, like we were still a holiday, like we were still at the beach and everything. And I was like at the beach when I got, the, when I saw my agent, uh, there was like three missed calls from my agent. I was like, Ooh. Uh, I, usually I, I wouldn't like on holiday, I wouldn't like phone back, you know, but three missed calls in a row is quite a bit. So I phoned back and like got the call, like, oh, it, it, it was devastating. Honestly, it, it was, it was devastating. Um, and yeah, that, that I suppose in my eyes as well, that's where like rugby started to change a bit for me as well, where I I realized that for some people involved in rugby, like it is also just a business, you know, um, and it's not just about people and it's also about making money. So talk us through then the decision to retire at age 29, just how difficult was that decision to make? Um, the process, I'm, I'm guessing probably the honeymoon might have come into that a little bit. <laughs> no, the, the honeymoon process... was quite a while ago, already. it was already uh, three, or, three or four years ago, so no, no, it's, it's good. But still, um, it was still sitting in the back of your mind, right? And so the yeah, process no, 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 of it's, deciding it's, yeah. age 29, and then what will come next for you? What have you got planned for life in Montpellier after rugby? Yeah, so um, so the decision to to stop actually it was like it was like a build up of different events. It wasn't one particular event or uh, one particular thing that made me um, want to stop, but um, it was basically just the fact I so I arrived at La Rochelle like things were really well. My first year when we were there, we played in the in the semifinals actually of the top fourteen, which was also which was the first for the club. Uh, first time ever they played in a you know quarter in a quarterfinals, um, and then no semi sorry, um, and then um, next season also started things when things were really well. I was playing the whole time like it, it wasn't all because of like my performance or because of injuries. Uh, I think I just started in that time. I also started studying, so I started doing stuff on the side, and um, I started being really interested in what I was I was studying uh, like financial management or wealth management. Um, it was really, really exciting doing something outside of rugby. Um, and I, I just it started becoming like a bit like the repetitiveness of, of, uh, of rugby and training every single day just started becoming like like a little bit, uh, a little bit much. Um, and I was, was kind of like losing a bit that that passion that I had for rugby when I was when I was young and I used to do it with with my friends and like 
There was there was no contracts, no money, nothing involved. Uh, we just play for each other and just live for the moment. Uh, so it's start, starting to lose a bit of that appeal. Um, and then it was also a big event that also happened was during, uh, there was, when was it, two years ago already, when the rugby season was cut short because of COVID. Um, during, during that time, um, we, it was at least two months that we spent at home, um, not training. And um, before, before I was always like, I always knew rugby was going to end one day. And so I always knew like, okay, I'm going to have to find something for after, after rugby. Um, so I was like, but I was always like a bit afraid, you know, like, what am I going to do after rugby? Like, I'm going to like build a new routine after rugby because I realized like staying in a routine might be important. And then those two months happened. And it just kind of naturally happened. Like I just found a new rhythm and like I was, I had a lot of time to, to do my, to do my studies. I really enjoyed it. And it just kind of showed me, you know, that there's, there's a whole nother life outside of rugby, that rugby is like kind of temporary. Um, and before where I used to be like, almost like nervous of the, the day is going to come where I'm going to have to be forced to start that life. Um, now, all of a sudden during COVID, during those two months, when I was kind of like basically living that life what I was going to live after rugby and for some reason like I loved it I absolutely enjoyed it I like I loved the fact that I could like I can determine what my day is going to look like like I don't, the fact that I'm not going to receive like a program pre-planned for the whole whole week telling me at what time I'm going to wake up what time I'm going to eat what time I'm going to be running how far I'm going to be running how how fast I'm going to have to run for um so it, it was just like just finding that freedom again to to kind of have a control over my life um, that I experienced during those two months was, was just, was amazing. Um, and so I went back to rugby um, and when I went back to rugby after, after COVID, it was, it was just not the same again, like having experienced what I experienced during those two months, um, it was just hard going back to like the repetitiveness of, of rugby and the, the fact that it's so rigid. Um, and so the, the, that was also a major event that that kind of made me um, made me decide that that I actually want to stop, and also that I want to move towards something. So I really enjoyed my studies as um, as uh, in, as a financial advisor, and so that that would be something that I'll pursue um, after after rugby when I move back to Montpellier. Um, but also I've got a lot of other things I want to do. Like I would like to eventually maybe start my own construction company. Um, Honestly, at the moment, I have so many ideas. I, I, I just feel like I just need, <laughs> I, I just need the time actually to pursue those ideas. And at the moment, like um, rugby, doesn't give me the the time or the freedom to pursue those ideas. Mate, it's amazing listening to you because I think you go through rugby, and everyone has that worry. And then there's a realization: there's two types of people. We're all institutionalized during our career in the structure, but then there's the people who, when that finishes really struggle and really battle and there's like people have mental yeah. health problems it's serious and then there's other people yeah, who've serious. been shackled and tied to rugby and actually there's a big old world out there that they want to go and explore and they're confident and ready to do so and you certainly fall into the latter <laughs> category so wish you but it's just amazing the passion you've already got there's another life that's about to start that's going to kick in yeah. you're a young bloke like 29 um and you'll be successful in whatever you do with the attitude and the the way you, you carry yourself um so good luck to you man it's awesome um that Thanks, being said man. that this whole decision won't be changed if you win the european trophy tomorrow and you're like no nah, i want to come back for more <laughs> <laughs> no it is something I, it is something i think about but uh, i mean um I, I, that, that's also kind of where i knew that i was i was ready to move on because so last season we had like a crack of a season like again like i said like in the history of the club it was the best performance that we've ever had in the local French league and in the, the European league. Um, and it was great to be a part of it, of the club and, um, and with the boys. Um, but, but even then, um, like I, I often, I like play this scenario in my head. Like what if I woke up the next day after those two finals and we won both of those finals. And to be honest, I don't think that it would make a difference. Like if, if even like this weekend as well, like obviously I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna play to win, I wanna do everything for my team to win. Um, and if we do, if we win, it'll be it'll be amazing, it'll be a great moment of my life, but it won't change my, like it won't change who I am and it won't change what lies ahead in the future. 
um, I will still be the same guy and I'll still have to go through the same challenges um, in the future, whether I've won a, <laughs> a European Cup or not. Um, so, so that last season is like kind of also where I knew, like, even though like it was going really well, I was playing all the games. I wasn't, it, it, there was nothing, no injuries, nothing. Everything was going the best it probably could go. And even then I, I still felt like, ah, uh, I, I like I'm not enjoying this as much as I probably should be enjoying this and that there's something else I would enjoy more and obviously we hope you do go out with a trophy but we don't know if you're going to win the Champions Cup or the top 14 but is there an element of you that does want to go out on top at least in terms of on your own terms and at the top level because we had Dylan Leeds on a couple of weeks ago he was trying to get Johnny out of retirement to play in Federal Land or something like that <laughs> but he, <laughs> But he did say that your decision had made them all kind of think and all chat about it. And he said that he was talking to Roman Rule and Roman Rule's going to go down the leagues and play till he's 40 or something like that. So is there an element of you that at least wants to go out, you know, on your own terms and at the top level? Yeah. Um, so I just want to touch on something you said. I, I find it very interesting is that um, I think for a lot of players also, and for me, that was a final hurdle to overcome to stopping rugby uh, was the financial aspect of it is that, I realize that there's probably no job I'm going to do after rugby is going to pay me the salary that, that I am fortunate to earn today. It's a misconception. Like, I think we get caught up in you can never, ever do it. You can. This is the weird thing. You, you get caught in the structure of what salaries look like in professional rugby. But when you leave, there are so many different... You've just mentioned financial planning, wealth planning, the possibility of running your own construction company. If you do that, you will earn better than you sure. currently earn in rugby, 100%. No, no, no. That, that, I, I, I think it is possible. It's not a question of whether, whether it is, isn't possible. Um, I just think it's like that maybe not many people will earn, many rugby players will earn after rugby what they earn playing rugby. So I, I do believe that it's, it yeah. is possible for some guys. <laughs> like if you want to go to work hard and like build your own company, of course, it, it is possible. Um, but so I think for a lot of players, that is like something that really holds them back. And for so I was the same. Like I felt like in my head, I had it planned out. I was like, oh, if I can play until like 35, even if I have to go play at a second division club, and even if I don't enjoy rugby anymore, you know, I'll do it because like just to be able to save up a little bit more money for after rugby. Um, but the reality is then also like you, you never have enough money. Like even that money, you will, you will feel like it's not enough, you know. <laughs> Um, and so, like, so we joke, we joke with like, uh, with Dylan, you mentioned Dylan earlier, like, um, some, some days when like days are a bit rough, like he has a thing that he said, he keeps on saying like only 10 more years, baby. Like he keeps, he keeps saying, <laughs> he's saying it as like a ironic way of telling himself like, oh, he's going to play for 10 more years. But so when it, when it's tough, you gotta, like, you gotta remind yourself. That like yeah you you in this for for the long run and for me like I just couldn't for me thinking this that I, what I do now I have to do for ten more years like I yeah I I, I couldn't I I I I just couldn't like I just felt like I had to had to move on to to something else and that's the more important bit is that it's not really a financial decision because it's clearly not it's a work life balance pleasure what gets you out of bed exactly. what do you want to do with your life and that ultimately is more important I think there's a lot of boys as well get caught the other way. They get stuck in the structure and I have to do this until I'm this age and I have to destroy my yeah. body because you don't, you're free to do whatever you want. You can cut and exactly, choose exactly. whenever you want so, to do it. You're 29 and you're, you're, you're out there doing yeah. what you want to do in the South of France in a completely different country, which is inspirational yeah. to a lot of people. You don't have to be stuck in whatever you're doing, whether that's a rugby player, exactly. Ricky, it doesn't or matter. Any, or, any other, or any other job you, or any other career you've chosen. I, I, I think that's, that's a cool thing today. More and more people are realizing it. That, and I think um, for a lot of people, that confinement period during COVID also helped them with that. It's exactly that. Like it kind of gave us a moment to just stop whatever we were doing and just do a bit of introspection. Like, am I actually enjoying what I'm doing at the moment? And do I want to continue in this, with this, this career or living in this certain way? And I think a lot of people did introspection and they saw actually, well, if it's not something that you actually enjoy and that, creates a good work-life balance then maybe there's something something better out there and so for me the work-life balance thing was was a massive thing um another thing as a rugby player is that like we play on weekends unfortunately so so 
you never have like two days uh, off straight in a row. Um, and, and that was also something that was starting to like to bug me a bit. Like um, now I live in La Rochelle and they like, I really get along well with my neighbors. Um, but weekends is when they do like their social life. That's, that's when they're social and that's when they go to, away together on weekends and stuff. And I can never do that um, because always like Saturdays I play rugby, Sundays I'm so tired and my body so sore that I can't get up off the couch. Um, so I, I almost weekends, I can't do stuff with them. So just the fact that my life was like out of sync and out of balance with the rest of like the people and society around me, that was also something that was starting to, to bug me a bit. And then I was wanting to like just pursue a bit more, like the fact of you know, to have a weekend would just be, be awesome. Definitely not going to go into the media alongside rugby then. That's, that's also at weekends. <laughs> for them, so, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's actually for some reason why like, I want to like when I stop, I I want to move on to something that's completely different, like not at all rugby, rugby related. Um, I always feel like I just need a break from rugby. To be honest, like I I should tell myself I don't know if I should actually tell myself because I do it now. Like I if I have free time um, or if I do manage to have a weekend off, which is really rare, I don't spend it like watching rugby on the TV. Like <laughs> you're a smart man. Work, you're a smart man. Work, you know? <laughs> I think it's a it's a fascinating subject because from the outside, as someone who's not entrenched as a as a player in rugby, you often hear, you know when the time's right, you know when it's your time. But it's more complicated than that, isn't it? And as you're both talking there, you must know plenty of players who probably within themselves did know that the time was right, but played on for two or three more years. Definitely. Yeah, yeah for me, I it was it, it, I don't know. It's a hard. It's a hard one of whether the time's right. Like, I was. I felt like I had to listen to what was going on in my head and like what my heart was telling me as well. Um, but it's still, it was a decision I had to. I had to make because at the same time, like when I can come up with all the like things that I don't enjoy about rugby, I can also on the same time come up with many good things about rugby. Um, and so you can be persuaded either way but like for me there came a moment when I had to make a choice um, and kind of draw the line in the sand and just decide listen yeah that I'm because uh, yeah also for me like like because things are going well then I'm not stopping because of injuries like the door was still open to continue um, at La Rochelle next season um, and so when those talks came up n- when knowing what I know and what I just told you guys like that was a hard thing. Like actually the moment I said it, I told people actually that I'm going to do it. That's a moment when everything for me changed. Like uh, before it was just an idea in my head, but when I actually told people, um, listen, yeah, I am going to stop. Um, for me, then it, it also became, it became real. And I managed to then actually be convinced that that is what I need to, that that is right for me, you know? Um but I can just imagine like for some players, like that decision, it's such a tough one trying to find, because you can come up with so many like excuses for both cases. It, it's hard to, to know what is right. One of the bits you're not going to miss, <clears throat> and this was probably my biggest fear during rugby, was the contract negotiation time. So when you're yeah. still playing, you're like, right, where am I going to end up? Do they still want me? Am I good enough to keep playing? Where am I going to go? Where's my family going to go to school? Like all those questions. And then when you finish, it's really weird. You find the stability in that I don't have to move. I don't have to pack bags. I can just, we can just live a normal That's life a choice. wherever choice we choose. Anyone. It's really yeah. bizarre. But then it's weird when you're in that, and it's weird to call it a rat race. When you're in the sort of rugby rat race, you accept that as part of that. That's one of the negatives. But ultimately for me, it was overwhelmingly positive. I love my rugby career. But there's not many people. In fact, I don't think I know any other people that are brave enough or as brave as you've been to say, actually, do you know what? I'd rather do something else more interesting, age 29, and live my life in a different way. So yeah. it's been awesome talking, man. Um, I had a good friend that played with me at, um, at La Rochelle. Um, he's, he was a Dutch boy, actually. He came, to, he came to La Rochelle when he was very young. He was in the academy and just went through the ranks. And he played uh, last season with us. He was still part of last season. Um, in O'Keefe. Zeno Keefe, yeah. Yeah, Zeno Keefe, yeah. And um, so he, to be honest, like he helped me a lot in this as well, because he kind of actually showed me the way. Because he was similar. He, he, was, he was 30 as well last, so last season. Um, he came to the end of his contract. 
Um, and then he had options elsewhere. Um, but similar to me, he, he just decided, you know, actually like I, I have these other, other passions that I, I want to, to follow. And then he just decided, well, I'm, I'm going to stop rugby and move on. And for me knowing, because in, in rugby, like you guys say, like you don't hear that very often. You don't hear of many guys who willingly decide to stop and move on. Like most guys probably stop when it's too late. Um, do one or two seasons too many um, and so when he did that I was like I was in admiration of him like I, I couldn't believe that he had the courage to be honest because me it was it was very courageous for someone to do that um, and so uh, he really like kind of also showed me that you know it's possible and that if you want to if you want to move on you have other things you want to pursue like like go for it don't don't let the don't let the fear of the unknown keep you from from staying with what you know, even if you're not happy with what you do. Like like to like embrace the unknown and, and go towards it. And especially as a back row as well, you two and Zeno as well. Is there an element where there is a physical element? You mentioned you're injury free, you're happy, you're playing well, but you don't want to push it too far. You do want to get out because yeah. we know what we know what can happen. Yeah, no, 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 exactly. Like uh I mean, I've had a few head injuries, but like not too bad. I've been quite lucky. Um, I haven't had too many uh, broken bones or ligaments. I've I've been quite. I came out quite unscathed. But you know, like even at 29, like you're not, like you're not 21 anymore. Like uh, I'm running. I'm running a little bit slower. Like I'm not as powerful as I as I used to be anymore. Like things just takes a little bit more effort. You know, like the, to warm up the body it takes now all of a sudden like. 30 minutes and not just five minutes. So wait, wait um, till you get to 36 or 37 <laughs> eh, Johnny. <laughs> no, you don't want to know, mate. Gonna get better after rugby. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, no, so um, so that was something in my in my head. Like I, I don't want to be playing the last season or last two seasons just suffering through physic suffering through the season physically. Like I I, I just I just know I would have, take no pleasure in that and also like if, if I'm not happy in what I do, it also spills over into my relationships with other people. And so I just know if I'm miserable because I'm in physical pain, I'll be miserable to the people around me. And I, I just, I didn't want to go down that road. And also, um, we've seen Frank Sinatra do it. You could be rugby's Frank Sinatra. If, if you do something else, then you could come back for a few months. Medical joker next year, the year after. You got time. <laughs> Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Like everything, anything is possible. Um, I, I don't see myself coming back, to be honest. Um, I, I, ju I just think like if, if I speak to people who have stopped rugby and moved on and of course like we said earlier some people have struggled really struggle after rugby um, and like so it causes mental health issues and everything um, but there are also other people who like really made the transition quite smoothly and, and when I speak to those people a lot of them like don't have any regrets stopping and they really enjoy their life after rugby so that, that has been very uh, convincing to me that uh, moving on is possible and you can do it in a good way. And like, it, it can actually be, you can, like, it's like rugby so short, like there's still like a whole big life and a big career um, ahead. So like, yeah, you can go pursue those things without any fear or regret. And back to this season, obviously you're doing what you're doing. We know Victor Vito is hanging up his boots as well. We, we have had, Dylan on we spoke to Dylan we sort of know that the rest of the guys are using you and Victor as a just a little bit of extra motivation they want to win something for you so <laughs> I know Ronan especially he likes using that one <laughs> he likes using that one as a, as a motivation um I, I I think he might have actually announced Victor Timon before Victor actually announced it himself <laughs> 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 Um, so they, you'll be but, responsible. You'll be responsible on the field, but you can also say you're welcome. We provided the motivation as well. <laughs> exactly. We have set the stage. You guys just now <laughs> finished the business. Um, no, no, no. It's especially with a lot of the French boys as well. Like you know, like the stereotypical emotional like French guys. They they uh, they 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 want to give us like a good send of as well. You know they. They feel like they they owe it to us. I, I don't feel at all like they owe us anything, you know. Like, um, but for them, it's true. It, it adds like an extra motivation. Like they want us to to leave the club, leave rugby, and leave with the best possible scenario that we we could imagine. 
So I, th I think for the players also, we at La Rochelle actually as well at our club. So me and Victor are stopping rugby, but we have quite a few guys that are actually playing um, that are like the regular starters that are actually going to be leaving this club and moving on to, to other clubs as well. Um, so there is this massive thing of like, um, we want to send the guys off properly. Um, so it is adding a bit of being the underdogs and having that as a motivation. I think it's, it's good. And you mentioned what you're going to do next. And obviously having now got your French citizenship, been through that process, staying in France, was, was there a moment during this journey when you realized, yeah, I want to stay after I'm finished playing? Um, yeah, so I, I, it was weird when I, when I came over to France, I kind of, uh, I kind of really like in my mind, it was like, again, it was like kind of just like this little idea. It was like, what if, what if I actually like stay here and make my life here? Um, so when I came over, I was also like very involved in trying to learn the language. Cause I, I realized like if, if I want to have a stand chance of actually living my life here, like I have to get to learn how to speak French because you just can't live here and only speak English. Um, or I mean, you can, but uh, you'll find it very, very tough. Um, and so for, it's, it's an idea, like I, I've never been like, um, I love my family back in South Africa and every time I go back, I, I love being there. I love the culture, I love the people. Um, but yeah, I, I went to boarding school as a child as well. And so I was used to like not being with my family. And then when I went to go play rugby in Pretoria, I was, I was away from my family. I saw them only like two times a year. So I think like slowly I kind of get used to also living apart from family. Um, and so when I met my wife, actually her parents still live um, just outside of Montpellier. Um, so we will be quite fortunate to have some family. I won't have my, my, my parents, but her parents do live there. And I think that was also another thing is like, um, we, we realize the importance of family and we we realize that it's it's great if we have the opportunity to live close to family um and so we wanted also to move closer closer to family um but so yeah it was this idea that started like slowly to develop and yeah today i i love south africa but i i don't see myself going going back there other than holiday reasons well thanks so much for coming on and sharing your journey with us telling us what's next we really hope you go out with a trophy held aloft and if you do maybe you can come back and tell us about the celebrations also uh we'll do yeah we are really excited for this weekend's game and like uh like you guys as well obviously we we hope you win and i can like finish my career on like the best note possible good luck best of luck mate and congrats Thanks, on guys. an awesome Thanks career we really, had, we really had a blast absolutely fascinating that johnny the retirement angle we can all go on too long. He's not. Fascinating bloke. Um, and generally, the game tells you that it's time to stop. Um, a combination of the game and age. But it's really interesting to hear from somebody that's telling the game, actually, do you know what? I've had enough. I've had fun. But I want to get on to something else. Um, and it happens to us all. But normally, 99.9% .9 of us cling on way too long. And then we end up in an absolute <laughs> mess. <laughs> Example in front of you. Um, <laughs> But it's really, really refreshing just to hear from somebody with a completely different perspective. And again, 99% of people would do the other, they would do the other way. They would go on too long. They would drag it out. Whereas he is keen to get on with his life and enjoy different challenges. So really smart boy, um, really refreshing to have him on. Um, and yeah, really hope it goes well for him. It'd be great to see him go out. He said it's not going to be life-changing. It's not going to affect his life in 40, 50 years time. But it's really nice to have the memory, to have the souvenir, to have your family there to pick up a medal, have the photo. Like for some people, it's absolutely everything. For him, it seems like it'd be slightly more insignificant, but those are memories that you absolutely cherish. So for him to finish like that um, would be exceptional. So best of luck to him and the La Rochelle boys tomorrow. We're not really going to discuss the top 14 much because we'll be back again before you know it to build up to a huge final round of matches in the top 14 season. But it's about time we did our meter moment of the week. So what have you got for us, Johnny? Comes from Bordeaux, mate. Um, they absolutely smashed Leon, which isn't the best prep for their Challenge Cup final. Um, but the man central to everything positive in that performance was Mathieu Jalibert, back fit after struggling with injury, but just a freak show, taking the ball to the line, constant threat, putting other people into space, great decision-making, and he scored an absolute wonder try. <laughs> Again, 
fantastic hard track and it suits no one better than this guy. So great to see him back. His performance all round was absolutely ridiculous and he scored one hell of a try. So Matthew Jalibar picks up this weekend's meter moment of the week. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 20% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20, and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. And before we chat just a little bit about the All French Challenge Cup final, summer's coming, Johnny, and we've got beers for people. Cracking beers, mate. And they don't make you feel like crap for 10 days afterwards. <laughs> as all other beers do for me. Um, when I first tried these back in Scotland, I now have them stacked in my fridge here in the south of France. Um, quality sitting by the pool and sipping on those. And that's it. It means I can actually function the day after drinking them because they got zero alcohol in them and they taste great. So yeah, days brewing, check them out on Instagram, get to the eShop and get some beers for the summer. Yeah, days is a new breed of alcohol-free beer created for those like Johnny, who want to do more. Proudly brewed in Johnny's native Scotland, using locally sourced ingredients, their beers are 0.0% ABV and low calorie. And they're now B Corp certified company as well, committing 2% of all sales to charities that empower fresh thinking towards mental health. Brewed for good times, good days, and good tomorrows, you can enjoy all the great moments associated with a cold beer just without the side effects. And with over 700 five-star reviews, it tastes great too. So just head over to daysbrewing.com and use the code RugbyPass15 to get 15% off a case. Challenge Cup final, Johnny. All French affair. Leon, Toulon. How do you yep. see it going? Um, after watching both the semis, I think that Toulon will edge it. Um, just as well where they've come from. Again, like La Rochelle, it's the type of story that we're after. Um for a group of people coming through. And I think Toulon have just got enough now. They've got everyone back fit. Cheslin Colby even is back fit. But after seeing how they dispatched Saracens in their semi, that blend of power, pace, and know-how, um, with, whether it's Etza Beth, whether it's Carbonell, they just have everyone back fit, everyone on form, and they seem to finally be clicking after a really difficult season. You compare that with Leon, their semi against Wasps, where they won it, but it wasn't easy, and they still look like they have a little bit of a soft underbelly. Um, Certain aspects of their game, they still struggle with exiting. They still cough up a bit of ball. And I just think when you give a team like Toulon with that amount of firepower and that amount of hunger at the minute, um, those opportunities um, you'll pay. So I would say Toulon will just edge that one. And it wouldn't be a week in French rugby without a bit of transfer talk. So any whispers for us? Leone Nakarawa, former European player of the year, looks like he's moving from Toulon to Exeter. Hasn't quite worked for him at Toulon. He's one of the... The players that's had reduced game time after a couple of serious injuries um, and a bit of time out the game, potentially to Exeter, Bristol or Worcester in the Premiership. Not sure where he's going to end up. He was going to Ulster before he went to Seal as well, wasn't he? So he's He was, but it looked like that was a medical that fell through. Um, yeah. But then he's been back playing and he's back fit. So I moved to the Premiership for him. Zach Mercer, old Zach to Gloucester. Again, that's really. Been- pumped around. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen. You've got to think he's got a fairly hefty contract in Montpellier and we've already spoken about it on here. He's absolutely loved in that neck of the woods. But if he wants international recognition, he wants to play for England, potentially already ahead of the World Cup coming up around the corner and move back to England again is on the cards. I, with all of these moves though, strangely, you know, premiership salary cap reducing, you think, where's it going to come? If you're taking people back from France, you're paying essentially to get them out of their contracts and bring them over. It's a bit of a stretch. And then one in the other direction, Richard Baz Barrington. Sairi's absolute stalwart moving to Agen. So a bit of movement. Um, it's going to be the roller coaster is going to start and the places are all starting to um, be taken. So I think the next two, three weeks, especially with the finals getting wrapped up, we're going to see some big names announced over the next few weeks. But those are a few that have come out from over here this week. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Vian Liebenberg for joining us and thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe, leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube and we will be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.